Thank you, Brittany. So I would like to welcome everyone to the new Perkins Administrator Orientation Session 3. Um, as Brittany stated, I'm Janelle Washington. Uh, I'm Director for Career Technical Education at the ICCB. And uh, we should have our other staff on the line to our uh, core Perkins stack team is what I'm calling us. Um, and they are Felita Murphy, Katie Velez, and Aja Howard. Um, again, thank you to um, the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support, or ICSPS, um, Dr. Amy Julian and Brittany Boston um, for their support and in making this orientation possible. So on today's agenda is the um, welcome and an orientation overview. We'll talk about some Perkins Grant administration basics, grant cycle responsibilities, and then we'll wrap up. So just a reminder, as um, I've mentioned in every session, and I under know that you know some people might be joining us for the first time, or you know reviewing this session by um, by itself. So I just wanted to note that this orientation uh, really came about at the request of Perkins administrators throughout the state who wanted a comprehensive introduction from ICCB around administering the Perkins grant locally, and. Uh, at the fall Perkins administrators meeting, we learned that 36% of uh, attendees have worked with Perkins for two years or less. And so this orientation series is designed to provide information to support new Illinois post-secondary Perkins administrators in navigating the Perkins 5 grant. And so some of the information might be repetitive if you've been working in the post-secondary space um, for any, um, any time. And, um, and or working with Perkins, or if maybe you had a robust training at your institution. So just keep in mind that the orientation series is designed with new Perkins uh, administrators in mind. And so we're making no assumptions regarding the level of information that participants may have. So I just ask that you take what you need and leave the rest. Um, yeah, and then just if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the chat or we'll hold them to the in, um, to the end and I'll be sure to address them. So here is our core ICCB Perkins team, uh, just a reminder of who you'll work with um, directly re regarding your Perkins grant. Um, but as you'll note, um, especially, you know, if you've been working with Perkins that our, our division has grown um, or working with CTE in general, our CTE division or department has grown. We have a team of nine uh, currently. And the way that we assign Perkins internally is that each of the three uh, direct CTE liaisons or Perkins liaisons, um, they all have 15 colleges that they work with directly. Um, we consider Illinois Eastern uh, one college and they're, they're, they're assigned to one. So that's how you get the, and then city colleges are assigned individually. So that's how we get 15 um, each. So if you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to our core team. Um, and from time to time, you could also have communication uh, from Bright because he is our program compliance staff for CTE. Okay, so before we dive into the grant cycle responsibilities, I kind of wanted to share some basic grant administration notes um, that I think are just helpful to know overall when it comes to your partner's grant. So this, please note that the highlights that I'm gonna talk about are not exhaustive. Um, again, just highlights. So first is that grant communication is directed to the Perkins primary contact that was listed on your Perkins application at the beginning of the uh, going into the, the new grant year. Or if you've um, updated us and let us know that there is now a new Perkins primary contact and we call the, the primary contact the Perkins administrators. Um, and so it's important to remember that if communication comes to you as the Perkins administrator, that it's your responsibility to share with any necessary campus, uh, campus contacts. For example, 
Um, I recently sent out information about changes to budget modifications or quarterly reporting. And if your fiscal folks or other grant management people are responsible for those, uh, for part of the, the reporting, so maybe they do the, the quarterly reporting, the quarterly financial reporting, then please make sure that you share that because we communicate again with the Perkins, the primary Perkins contact. And so you have it, it'll, it'll be up to you to make sure that that information gets shared with um with other people pertinent people at your institution and you know you'd be the one who would know that information like we wouldn't we wouldn't know um another thing is that ICCB uses the Amplifund uh platform or software for our Perkins grants grant management so this includes um applications are submitted in Amplifund and um, quarterly reporting and budget modifications also are submitted in Amplifund. And so if you need help getting connected to Amplifund, um, setting up your account to log in and things like that, then just reach out to your CTE liaison. The other thing to note is that Perkins grant funds are issued on a reimbursement basis. So this isn't, you know, July 1, here are all your funds, you know, you... Um, have to request reimbursement. And you do that by completing a payment request form, which are this site that I have linked is the ICCB grants page and it has a lot of resources um, as far as like forms, um, how to complete the, the programmatic risk assessment and things like that, um, as well as any grant opportunities, um, com competitive grant opportunities that may come up. All the information is located on the ICCB grants web's web page. And so those payment requests, the payment request form is there, and you have to that must be completed and then emailed to grants management at their in their inbox. So those are not submitted in Amplifund. They have to be emailed. Um, something else that I thought was important to know is that. Perkins funds must supplement, not supplant, non-federal funds expended for CTE activities, um, meaning that so when it comes to supplanting, that is presumed to occur in three different circumstances. So if the college or institution was re, um, required to provide a service, um, so if, if the college uses Perkins funds to provide a service that, that was required to be made available under other federal, state, or local um, law, except as permitted in Section 25A5 of Perkins 5, um, or it, if you um, pay for an activity that was provided with non-federal funds in the year prior, or for something that was provided with non-federal funds for non-CTE students, but charge the Perkins for CTE students. So those are three instances that supplanting is presumed to, to have occurred and that would not be allowable. And then something else that's important to note is that in addition to the requirements of um, Perkins, the Code of Federal Regulations states that costs that are uh, must be allowable So, and by that, it means that in order for costs to be allowable and charged to the Perkins grant, they have to be reasonable and allow allocable. So basically, the cost has to be reasonable in that it doesn't exceed the amount that a prudent person would incur under the circumstances. And it also has to be allocable to, uh, to, the, to Perkins. So, and... Um, in accordance to the benefits received. So that means that um the that that here's an example that I have on here is that if you're supporting an instructor's salary at 50%, then 50% of their time must be spent in CTE um, or, or on Perkins. Um and so there might be some other like uh, you couldn't pay a general advisor. Uh, or academic advisor with Perkins funds um, because that's not um, allocable to Perkins only because that's something that is needed at the at the institution in general. 
All right. And so something else is that grant funds must be expended during the grant cycle and cannot cross fiscal years. And um, so this means that it's unallowable to pay for like multiple year subscriptions. I know this comes up sometimes because, you know, folks will offer um, discounts if you, you know, can pay for multiple years for a service or, um, or you know, a, a equipment rental or um, software, things like that. But it is unallowable to pay for multiple year subscriptions. And I think some of the common um, services or subscriptions that people use in CTE and Perkins, I think they kind of understand that and they'll set your, um, their, they'll set their, um, their subscription cycle to kind of align with the grant cycle. So starting um, July 1 and then June 30th, I see that often. And so if you're not finding that, then that's something that you should be able to work out. Well, you'd have to work out with them because um, you can't pay for multiple year subscriptions. Um, and, and in the same vein, you cannot pay for activities that will occur in another fiscal year. And so like, if you're, you know, paying for, as I see this a lot um, and, one college had a, a really good um, solution for it where the grant cycle ends June 30th, but they were having a um, like a career exploration event for for um, middle school, high school students in the summer where they ha wouldn't have received their next fiscal year grant. And so they use institutional funds to cover because they couldn't use, you know, it's easy to think, oh, I'm planning this event. It's in the summer, um, but you can't cross fiscal years. And so just being careful about things like that. Um, something else that's important is that Perkins Grant Funds may not directly support individual students. So funds are design CTE Perkins funds are designed to support the the CTE as a whole. And so the only allowable direct student support is is allowed through Perkins and that's to support um that's support to reduce or em eliminate out of pocket expenses for special populations and so some common expenses are like transportation assistance you'll see providing gas cards or um um, bus tokens, mileage reimbursement, things like that, uh, child care assistance, textbook loans. Um, and I know that's starting to get a little, um, that's starting, that's starting to shift a little bit because textbooks are becoming, <laughs> the actual physical tech, physical textbooks are almost becoming obsolete in some situations. And, and so there's, provisions to kind of to to kind of move with the times right and so if you're needing to provide um access codes or something like that i mean if a textbook is not a physical test textbook is not available or reasonable because you're not going to use it again then you know you can make exceptions to provide those access codes to students i mean they also like supply loans and that could be tool kits um equipment not equipment like toolkits that a student might need, maybe like a, an automotive um, student might need, you know, tools. Um, a, additionally, like laptops, calculators, uh, scrubs, um, things like that. And then another thing to note is that memberships in business, technical, and professional organizations are allowable at the institutional level. So um, the way that the the code of federal regulations is interpreted is that they must they can't be individual. Um, and same thing, like you could subscribe to business, technical, professional, um, like periodicals or however those things are are done these days. Uh, if they're still printed, um, you can subscribe to those at the institutional level if they're related to CTE. A um, couple other things is that property records must be maintained for all equipment purchased with Perkins funds and must include all of these things. So you're talking the date of purchase, um, all of everything that's listed here. Um, and then something else to note is that equipment may be disposed of when it's no longer needed for the original uh, project or program. So that could be getting rid of it totally or um, trading it in for towards new equipment. 
it could be um, giving it to another program or division within the college. So the things that, to note there though are that if the item has a current fair market value less than $5,000, then you can um, sell or dispose of that. Again, like I said, give it to another department within the institution. Um, and you don't have any further financial obligations to ICCB. You just need to note that disposal on your inventory. And then also disposal of equipment that has a current fair market value above $5,000 or more does require um, written approval. So you can just email me um, to let me know, you know, that you're wanting to dispose of this equipment. And once um, I pro provide approval, then you just have to note that in your inventory. And I think this wraps up the the, the important things I um, wanted to highlight. So uh, the Stevens Amendment. So that is federal legislation regarding the disclosure of federal funds and grant projects. And so for any documents that you're creating for uh, public dissemination, uh, like any statements, press release, publications, you know, marketing materials, things of that nature, you um, have to include on the document, the percentage of the total amount that Perkins Funds financed that the cost of producing that publication. Um, and it must be documented. So here's an example statement. Um, this publication was funded pursuant to a grant from the Illinois Community College Board and funded 100% through Perkins 5. So if there's any, like I said, any publication or anything like that, you'll just want to make sure that you include that note. All right, so we'll squ switch gears. Now, like, again, that, that was just meant to kind of highlight some important things that I think are, they, they, they come up commonly um, from Perkins administrators. That list is not exhaustive. Um, your uniform grant agreement, the code of federal regulations, the Perkins Act, that's, you know, where you're going to get all of your information, all, all of your information. Um, but I, I just wanted to pull out some things that I think are kind of common to, to recall, to remember. Um, and in, in addition, we do have a CTE grant manual, but I think it was last updated in 2019. So that is on our agenda to, to update. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's still a really good resource. Um, and a, and a first step to use if you, if you have any questions, a lot of the information that I just talked about, I kind of pulled it from there. So that is a good resource. So, okay, so now we'll talk about grant cycle responsibilities. And first up is quarterly reporting. So quarterly financial and programmatic reports are due 30 days after the quarter ends. And that's per the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations. Um, programmatic reporting is completed in the annual work plan and reporting template. And so we incorporated a few years ago, we incorporated the programmatic reporting into the, the annual work plan. So in your annual work plan, if you recall um, from previous sessions, the annual work plan is the part of the application where you'll detail all of the activities that you're going to complete for Perkins for the fiscal year. And so to make it to streamline reporting on those activities, we incorporated the quarterly report right in that document. So, and we'll, we'll keep track of it. So, for the for quarter one, we'll go into your document. There's like four different areas and they're designated for quarter one through quarter four. And you'll just fill out the um, apl applicable quarter that you're reporting for in that document. I think it makes it a lot easier because before there was like a separate document where you have to kind of copy your activities over and report there. So this makes it much more uh, streamlined. And then financial reporting is completed in the quarterly financial report spreadsheet. And so we kind of deviated away from that last year um, due to submitting reports and Amplifun, but our grants management people, um, staff went back to the spreadsheet. And I think it kind of makes it a lot easier for, for you all as well. 
And then the last thing is that quarterly report, as I said before, is submitted and amplified. Here's the schedule. Uh, we just completed quarter one reports. Um, they were due October 30th. And so quarter two is going to be due January 30th. Okay, so I want to switch gears and kind of talk about how to submit quarterly reports in Amplify. And I'm going to talk through it. And I realize that without like a live demonstration, you know, there's not, you know, it might, it's not as engaging. However, you know, we do have screenshots to, to hopefully help. And this could be used as a resource when it's time to complete your quarterly reporting. And so within Amplifund, there is a place um, for you to submit quarterly reporting. They're called reporting periods. Um, from the reporting period page, you can see any performance reports or performance periods that have been previously submitted. And then there's a plus icon in the top right of the screen that you'd have to click to create a new reporting period. And from there, you can select the time period that you're going to be reporting. And then after that, you'd have to, well, before that, you have to cl click achievements. I'm sorry. So you'll click achievements. And then um, because Amplifying uses words um, multiple ways, but achievements are, it's actually your performance reporting period. And so you will see it, it if you, once you click on achievements, when you look at the reporting period, it'll say performance reporting period. Um, so then you'll click the time period that, that you're, reporting and then click save. And then from there, so I should say, prior to that, your annual, your quarterly reporting, programmatic reporting and annual work plan and your financial reporting period should already be completed um, before you start. So once, once you open that reporting period, you'll complete the grantee certification where you're going to enter the name of the authorized individual from the organization. So that's um, likely going to be whoever is submitting the report or authorized to submit the report. Um, there's a place for their title, their phone number, their email address. And then there are a few questions on there and the questions are in Amplify. So just a little bit of background about Amplify. Like I said, it's, it's ICCB's grant uh, management system um, by way of requirement through the state of Illinois. So the state of Illinois purchased, um, they paid to be part of Amplifund. And so all agencies within Illinois are supposed to have their grants managed through the Amplifund platform. So it's not just um, ICCB who uses Amplifund. It should be all, all, all um, all agencies within the state who are making grants. And I think the only caveat is if they had their own like system that they were already using. Um, and so with that being said, this information about the grantee certification report transmittal, that comes from the state standard uh, performance reporting document. They just incorporated that because um, some agencies or grants use that standard um, program report. However, we have authorization or permission to use the quarterly reports that we use. So like to, to use our um, annual, the questions are to, to use our annual work plan as your reporting template instead of completing that periodic performance report. However, because they incorporated it into, because Amplifund is statewide, they incorporated those elements into Amplifund and you have to answer the questions because they're required. Um, so, and then, so after entering the certification, you just answer a couple questions about whether it's the final report or if an alter, alternate file or external database is, is allowed. We're gonna say no, but because you are updating, uploading your reports to this platform. Um, and so then there's a place that says initial submission. Um, next is upload periodic report, initial submission. And so there, that's where you will attach the quarterly reporting 
um, the quarterly pro programmatic, so your annual work plan document, as well as the quarterly um, financial report spreadsheet. And I do want to note that um, I see often where the the there's a there's a the Perkins administrator is responsible for the programmatic reporting, but there's another division, be it fiscal um, or grants management who's responsible for uploading and submitting the quarterly financial report. And as long as both individuals have access, they can both get in there and upload the report that they need. So somebody, if you know one person starts the reporting period, the other individual can go in and add their document later. But the last person to, to um, add their documentation will do the next steps. Um, or the final steps, I'll say. So just note that if you're not responsible for quarterly financial reporting, then you just need to communicate with the person who is and let them know that, you know, you can go in or, you know, however you want to set it up, whoever somebody starts it and or, you know, however, however it works best for you. But just know that multiple people do have access to the reporting periods. So after you upload the reports and enter all that information, there's a couple more questions that you'll just answer yes to. And then finally, here is the how you complete the reporting period. So if you click cancel, it won't save the progress and it'll take you back to the reporting period screen. Um, however, if you click save, it's going to save the progress, but not submit it to ICCV. And that's what I was talking about, where like the, you can return to the reporting period if you have any other edits before you submit. And again, like I said, it's useful if multiple ind individuals contribute to quarterly reporting. And then finally, click and close will save the reporting period and submit it to ICCB. So after you do that, you can't make any changes after the reporting period is closed unless it's rejected by ICCB and then returned for revisions. And so um, I'm finding that don't think we're having as many revisions now that we streamlined reporting and we put both of the submission of the quarterly financial report and the programmatic report in the performance reporting period. Um, we were having a lot of issues prior because there was a performance plan and achievements and all of that. So hopefully this streamlined it and we're, we're not having to reject it. But if you know that, notice that, oh, I submitted that before um, I was ready or I submitted the wrong document, sorry, um, you can just email your Perkins liaison and or CTE liaison and they will, they can reject it for you. So you can add whatever information that you need to add. So that completes a uh, quarterly reporting in Amplified. And now we'll move on to budget modifications. So uh, new this year, grantees are allowed to make budget category transfers up to $50,000, but not exceeding 10, 10% sorry, of the total award before seeking approval. Um, so the, the threshold was made wider for you to have discretion to make budget modifications prior to seeking approval. Um, but the key thing to remember is that any modifications that include a change in scope will require the submission of a budget modification request. Um, so a change of scope could be, you know, you had you were purchasing equipment for welding, you no longer need that, and now you're gonna um, add funds to for traveling or professional development or something like that. So if you do have a, a change of scope, those have to be, no matter, you know, how what if it's less than 50,000, less than 10%, you still have to submit that. And then May 1st is the deadline. This got moved up. It used to be later. But May 1st is the deadline to submit budget modification request. And that just gives um, more time to be able to get that approved and get the, um, if you're ordering supplies or equipment, that you can get that done before the end of the grant cycle. Um, revised uniform budgets are required to be submitted with Perkins 
budget modifications. So at the time of your application, you have to complete a uniform budget spreadsheet that details all of your expenditures. And we in Perkins and CTE, we require that you submit that uniform budget spreadsheet revised. So like whatever you're changing with the proposed modification, you need to update every tab as well as the section A tab. So if you know you're changing the equipment and travel, you're gonna change the equipment and travel tabs. And then you also update your section A tab. So that's important. Um, because that's not required for all um budget modifications across grant programs, but it just helps us to get a fuller picture of what the funds are being um used for. Um, to make sure that, you know, we're looking at the 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 expenditures to make sure that they're allowable and, and things like that. So it just helps us to get a fuller picture. And it also makes sure that we're both working off the same budget going forward after the budget modification. Um, and then, as I mentioned, all budget modifications requests must be submitted in Amplified, and they are called amendments in Amplified. So I'll use the words interchangeably just because like we know them as budget modifications and uh i think that's going to be common to your institution as well but within amplifund again they're called amendments so here is how to submit those in amplifund so again I, it's not dynamic because i'm not walking through the process, but I do want to take some time to go to go through this because this is new. So um, probably shortly after the, the grant cycle started, we provided like a, a tutorial, a record, a video tutorial, as well as uh, written instructions for how to submit amendments in Amplifund. And as soon as we did that, they changed their process in their entire system. So for everybody in the United States that uses Amplifund, the whole the amendment process changed. And that was effective October 24th. Um, so I do I kind of want to walk through it, but please do not hesitate. I'll um and you know be transparent. I practiced with the amendments in Amplifund when they rolled them out. And it took me a couple tries to get it right. And part of that is because the the guide, so they did live um, sessions to kind of roll out this change. And they also provided a document that has the, um, that has the, the instructions, right? But once, but the, in the actual system, it doesn't work the same way that they displayed. So um, I do want to kind of point out a few things. So it's kind of similar to when you go to reporting periods, you're going to go to post award management and then amendments in this case. And there's a plus in the upper right hand corner where you'll click to add um, an amendment re request. From there, you're going to enter the request name. So it could be budget modification one. I think that's probably the most effective um sometimes people enter the date it could be whatever you want to call it you know budget modification one november 6 2024 um but whatever whatever you want to you want to name and then you'll click uh budget under the areas to amend so this is new if you ever completed a budget modification in amplifund this is completely new so the first thing you'll need to do is download. There's a button for you to click to download the budget. And this is important to note that this is totally separate than the uniform budget spreadsheet that you're also required to complete and, and, and submit. Um, so when you click download budget, it's going to take your current Amplifund budget and put it in a spreadsheet, in an Excel um, spreadsheet. And then you'll make the changes on that, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So you'll download that, click download. It will might be up in the top, you know, where you have a little, the download um, icon, or it might be open depending on um, what browser you're using. Um, so, so it's going to open up the spreadsheet. 
And it kind of looks like this, where it has all the categories, uh, the line items. So if you were around for your per for the Perkins application, you might know that we required the the Amplifund budget to be entered at the budget category level. So we don't we didn't we don't require you to enter your individual line items because you do a detailed job in that uniform budget. So we only, you know, gave instructions for, for entering the, the category. So for equipment, the line item is equipment and you're gonna put your total equipment, um, the, the total expenditures for everything that's in your equipment line, that category total is what you're gonna put in Amplify. And so your budget is gonna look um, a little streamlined because you're not gonna have several line items in, in Amplify. So according to their instructions, if you if you wanted to add a line item, you could. But again, we don't use this at the at the line item category, at the line item item level. So ideally you should be able to come here. So say you're changing equipment, construction is not an allowable use of um Perkins funds. So that won't be on your on your budget. But, but equipment, personnel, travel are. So ideally, according to their instructions and to their demonstration, um, if you come here and you change the total budgeted direct costs on that equipment line or whatever lines you're changing, so say you're taking away $20,000 here and you're adding it here. So you should be able to make this $20,000 and make this $30,000, ideally. And then that would trigger, sorry, I don't wanna use that word. That would um, that would then make Amplify, once this is saved and uploaded, the changes will be displayed to Amplify, which will show in a couple slides. But that's not, that was not happening. And I did email Amplify to let them know um, in hopes that they will, fix their system because it's not working in the way that they, you know, said that it would. So what I found, so in the meantime, um, until they fix it, you're likely going to have to delete the equipment line and then add another equipment line with your changes. And again, if you will, we can go into way more detail. If you have questions, um, just reach out. You can email me directly because um, typically I will say that too. Typically I do um, advise that you talk with your Perkins, your CTE liaison. So Felita, Aja, Katie. Um, but I've been working a lot with this. And so um, you can email us both and I'll be happy. I'd be happy to help if you need um, more assistance as you get through this. Cause I, I get, it's not going to be, it's not, it's not going to make sense until you get in there. <laughs> Um, and so, like I said, right now it's not working as intended, as they said in their live um, demonstrations and here where it says um, to change total budgeted line, update the total budgeted direct cost. So that's not working. So you'd have to delete it, put the new total line, add a new total line with the total for, for all categories that are changing. Um, they also have some notes on, so I use this information from the the document that they provided. So it just says, don't change the column header text. So like category line items. So don't change anything, any of those. Um, and also do not delete any, any of the columns that have an asterisk because those are required. Where it talks about like, the, the grant actuals and all of these things, like if you make changes there, it won't do anything in Amplify. Um, so, I mean, it's really no no point. The, real, the only thing that you should really be having to change is the total budgeted category. And then it says that grant the grant budgeted category, which is over here, um, is for reference only and changing in the spreadsheet will not result in any changes in Amplify. And so after you make your changes on that Amplify spreadsheet, you'll save the file and close it. 
Um, because in order to upload any documents in Amplify, they have to be closed. You'll get an error message. Like if you have the, the spreadsheet open and you try to upload it, it's going to tell you it's open and you can't do that. And that's just to make sure that you're uploading the document that you actually intend to upload. So after you save it, then there's a place for you to upload it. So budget revision, you'll click there and upload that Amplify budget that you um, just completed. And then there they have a required summary of changes narrative. And so this can be very brief because we require a justification and there's a place for the justification as well. So, um, and I'll talk about that. So just a, a brief summary of, of the changes that you completed. And so after you do that, once you um, upload that Excel Amplify Excel spreadsheet, your screen is going to look like this, and it's going to automatically read those changes that you made and display them here. And so it's going to show, like, here's what, what you removed, which this, so it worked here on their, in their instructions, but it didn't work on the document. Um, but I, ideally, it's going to show the change that you made, and then also whatever the new um, category was, it'll show that as well. And if you find, like, once you upload it, if that's not, if this is not correct as you intended it, as you intended it to be, then you can go back and open that document, save it again, and then re-upload it. And then it should adjust and show you your new changes. So then from there, there's a place underneath that that is your, where you can provide your detailed justification for for the modification or if you need more space and you want to attach a justification you can do that as well um so in the upload file section you can upload multiple documents so sometimes you know people you know you're the, the only thing that you're required to upload um is the uniform budget but if there's other documentation or things that you are choosing to provide to support the, the modification, you can also do that there. So you just it's, you can click choose file multiple times to add additional documents. And like I said, some people like to complete their justification in another document and upload that instead of type it into the box. And that's totally fine. I would just put a note in the justification box that says, please see it, um, the justification attached. And then from there, you can click save to return and finish later if you need to, or if you're ready to submit, you will click submit and it'll come, it'll go to your, um, your ICCB CTE liaison. So Felita, um, Katie or Aja will receive a notification from Amplifun that, that a budget modification or amendment request have been submitted and they'll go in and, and review it. Um, also, if you, are familiar with the amendment request process and amplifying from last year. If there was, uh, if if the if we needed additional information or for whatever reason, um, yeah, if we needed additional information, we have to reject it for more information. And it would like it would reject it, and you couldn't make updates to it. But now with this new change, they have allowed for uh, revisions to be completed on submitted budget modifications. So you wouldn't have to do enter the whole amendment request again. You would just go in if it's returned to you for more information. You could click that request and make the required revisions. So that sums up amendment request again. I think as we work through um, figuring this out with Amplifun and hopefully them changing their system to uh, be more efficient, then we'll have some some more updates. But if you're running into any issues, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'll be glad to help. All right, so now I wanna switch gears and talk about grant closeout. So I just have a few end of grant deadlines that I think are important. Well, that are important. Um, so May 1st is again, the last day to submit budget modifications. June 30th 
all of your grant funds must be obligated. Additionally, all goods and products, sorry for how that cut off, but all goods and products must be ordered and any services must be rendered by June 30th. And then August 1st is the last day to submit a payment request. Uh, final expenditure closeout reports are due August 30th, and we'll talk about that a little more briefly in the next slide. And then finally, August 31st, all goods and um, products must be received. So as far as um, the final expenditure closeout report, again, those are due after in, in, um, in August. And that's just to allow because there's some additional accounting that could take place. Like maybe you, you know, you ordered a product and you didn't receive it or came in over or under budget, you know. So the final expenditure close out just allows for you to do any final accounting that happens um, after your last quarter re report. This is the example from last year. Um, it could change. I probably it shouldn't change much, but similar to the way that you do uh, quarterly financial reporting, but again, it just allows you to give that final account of all the expenditures. And it also let, let you know like how much was expended and how much of the total grant was expended. Or in some cases, how much was not expended. I think one of these reports was, was different. It calculated things differently. All right, so then briefly, before we end for the day, um, I'll talk about programmatic monitoring, which is um, another grant cycle component. So with pro programmatic monitoring, the intent of that is to review the compliance with the laws, the grant deliverables that are in your notice of funding opportunity or in your Perkins guidelines. Um, in your grant application, in the Uniform Grant Agreement, um, in Perkins. And that comes from this, the Code of Federal Regulations. So we are required to monitor grants. Uh, during the monitoring process, information is requested and analyzed to determine the compliance of the specific review items. So we have a, a, a monitoring tool that goes out to grantees who are going to be monitored. And I'll talk about how that's determined in a second. But in general, there's a monitoring tool that grantees have to complete. And then the ICCB Perkins uh, liaison or CCE li liaison will come on site for the programmatic visit, um, unless it's a desk review, we'll review those in office. And we usually take a day, just one day. It's not, you know, if you're doing a, a on-site visit, we're not there for multiple days, it's, you know, one day for a few hours. Um, so to deter, so the risk base, so the risk based monitoring system applies to all grants you receive through ICCB. So it's not just Perkins. Um, if you have an adult ed grant, those are those undergo monitoring, um, et cetera. But for us in, in CTE, the CTE lia liaisons will monitor the Perkins basic grant. So that's just your regular Perkins grant. And then also any Perkins leadership grants. And so those are competitive where they're offered um, every couple of fiscal years. I think we have one currently going on now. So um, competitive where you have to write to specific um, components that are, are, are required of the grant and you may you know receive a, a leadership grant. And so if you do, we'll monitor those as well. And then it's just lists some of the things that we look at when we're monitoring the, the leadership grants. But everything that we're monitoring as far as the per Perkins Basic is gonna be in the monitoring tool. And then you can also, you know, we'll ask for additional information for the leadership grant if it's um, applicable that year. Um, so how we determine, we use a risk-based assessment to determine which colleges will be monitored. So we look at fiscal and programmatic risk factors separately. And we also look at the programmatic risk separately as well. So we used to look at uh, Perkins, we would look at adult ed, uh, 
the the innovative bridge and transitions grant, we would look at all of those together and determine a risk score across the board with looking at those combined. Um, but we realized that like there were some some grants might have been monitored more frequently. Like you you could potentially a grantee could have had no no risk uh, points in their Perkins grant, but they're being monitored because of the other grants. And so um, last year we started to look at grants individually. So we only assess Perkins grants as far as um, determining who's gonna be monitored. And for the Perkins grant, we look, the risk is assessed based on factors, including, but not limited to <clears throat> um, unspent funds, uh, timely submission of quarterly reports or budget modifications, the experience of your Perkins leadership, and then the time since last monitoring. <clears throat> so if it's been a couple of years since you've been monitored, probably will receive uh, more points um, just to ensure that we're monitoring um, monitoring individuals accordingly. And then you'll also, and, and because of the way that this is separated, this could mean that you might, well, you're definitely gonna receive separate programmatic and fiscal fiscal reports. Um, and so when fiscal monitors, they'll monitor separately, they'll contact the fiscal, their fiscal contacts to let them know that they're gonna be monitoring and then they'll let them know what grants, you know, that they need. So when we're monitoring in CTE, we're only looking at your Perkins uh, programmatic side. And I just wanted to note that we're currently in a process of monitoring FY23 Perkins grants. And here shortly, we'll complete our risk assessment process for FY24 grants. And then we'll plan to conduct those on-site um, visits in the spring or the early summer. Um, our, our goal is to get us in a place where we're monitoring right after the fiscal year ends. Um, so that is the goal because it used to be like, I think it was almost two years behind. So where like you're monitoring FY21 grants in fiscal year 23 and nobody could, you know, it's hard to remember what happened. So our goal is to get the monitoring done shortly after the grant cycle ends. So hopefully um, we'll complete FY24 spring, summer, and then we'll be ready for FY25 right after that ends. So there's three different risk categories after we complete the, the, the risk assessments. Um, the first is elevator risk. And so if, if your institution's Perkins uh, risk score is in the top 20%, so we tally up all the scores and then the top 20% of Perkins grantees will receive on-site. They're considered elevator risk and they'll receive on-site on monitoring, monitoring visit. Again, the grantees have to complete their monitoring tool and submit documentation that we'll review prior to coming on site. Um, and also, you know, have a, then when we come on site, you'll, um, we have a, a conversation about the, your grant activities, the monitoring tool, documentation, things like that. Um, offer any technical assistance that you might be looking for. And then uh, after the, after the on-site visit is completed, you receive a formal monitoring report within, I think, 45 business days. And then for grantees who are moderate risk, they have a desk review and um, we'll reach out to let grantees know what information that they need to submit for that. And then for low risk, um, grantees will receive targeted technical assistance um, when necessary and they don't. Uh, moderate risk and low risk don't receive a formal monitoring report. Right. And that actually brings me to the end. Um, um, any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Again, this was just um, basic administration that I thought was important, just like high level things that everybody should kind of know that, you know, might not necessarily get addressed at Parkins administrator meetings and things like that. 
and then as well as go through some of the grant um, cycle responsibilities. So a couple questions. Yes, we will share the PowerPoint. We're going to share out this, the PowerPoint for all. So after next week is our last session, we'll share everything out as a package. Um, so grantees that are being monitored for FY23, we're already in that process. So if you're mon being monitored for 23, you already know, and you already have your business set up. Um, after we do the risk assessment um, for 24, we'll let you know as soon as we as soon as we determine that. We'll get the visit set up. We usually give um, ample time for you to be able to prepare if you're going to be monitored um, before we come on site so you can have time to. Um, so you have time to, to prepare. So, and yes, we'll share the, re the, the recording. So updates to annual, like updates to your annual work plan throughout the year. So um, this is Joel, by the way. Uh, I, uh, so some things changed since we originally wrote our plan. Um, like we're not going to be able to do certain things and so forth. And I think it's a little bit more than just a budget mod. Um, are we able to like to change some of our activities and those sorts of things within the year? Or do we have to wait till the next year? Yeah, so so oftentimes that's that's. That's um oftentimes those do occur with budget modifications. So but again, look to your point, they can not include a budget modification. That's totally fine. If you have a change in your um with activities that don't require a budget modification, just reach out to your CTE liaison and let them know and submit. Um just email them an updated copy of your so here's the thing: we don't require uh, if you ever have a budget modification, you're required and responsible for updating your annual work plan to match, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but when activity, so and we don't require that. Like we'll get that when you submit your quarterly report. That's you know. But in this case, if you're gonna have a change that doesn't require a budget modification, because we're not gonna know about that at all, just reach out to your CTE liaison and give them a copy. Like, like hey, let them have a conversation. Let them know what you're looking to change. That way, they can make sure that it's still meeting the Perkins requirements the same way that we do at the time of application. We just want to make sure that you're still going to be, that that activity is still going to meet the requirement of Perkins. Okay, so like type it into the, like modify the Word document for the annual plan and then send that to the rep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, good question. Yeah, because that, like I said, that usually happens with budget mods, but it can totally, because there, there are some activities that people um will write into their Perkins plan that don't require that don't use any Perkins funds so but yeah so yep yeah. feel free to reach out all right so I will go ahead and we'll end thank you all for attending we have one more session uh just to wrap up it probably won't be long at all um but I hope you all have a great rest of your day